Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, before we start, I just want to uh, firstly apologize for being late uh, and and stating an excuse for me being late, which was uh, which is last night I had a quite severe fever. Is it called fever? Fever. Fever. And today I went to the, today I went to the doctor, and I still have a sore throat. I still feel quite weak. So. Uh, May Allah increase the reward for me overcoming amin, this sickness. Amin, 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 amin. And uh, I was I was told that uh, the Chinese brothers and sisters are coming to 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 attend this talk because they find this to be an interesting topic. And then I convinced myself to overcome my uh, weakness and try to deliver this, uh, which is also an inspiration from the person Martin. He also. Overcome, overcame many difficulties in order to spread Islam, in order to connect uh, Islam and the Chinese people. So, uh, before we start today's uh, talk, I want to actually uh, mention the reason why we have this new series, inshallah, called the Muslim Legacies uh, series. So, you see, um, the tabi'in, many of the tabi'in, the uh, second generation, those who followed the Sahaba, they used to say that uh, we teach our children three things. Those are the most important, most fundamental knowledge that they need to know. Uh, one is, of course, the Quran. And we know that until this day, we still have many kids in the Middle East who memorize the Quran at the age of 10 or 12 or 15, right? So they, they, they emphasize the Quran. And then, of course, uh, the Muslim children need to know the seerah of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa uh, what a person he, he is and uh, how he lived his life. And then they also emphasize Hayat al Sahaba. They also emphasize the life of the Sahaba, the life of the, the biography of those who uh, practiced Islam and who really showed uh, what a Muslim should be. You know, uh, in the Quran, Allah actually talks about how the righteous people, those who do good, will be eventually with uh, Anbiya, wa Siddiqeen, wa Shuhadari, wa Salihin. He mentioned the Prophets those who confirmed the truth, yani the followers of the prophets, and then the shuhada, the martyrs who died for Islam, and then was uh, salihin, and the righteous people. So Islam is a very uh, practical religion in the sense that it's supposed to, uh, it's supposed to show its meaning and theory on human life, right? So when we recite Surah Al-Fatiha, when we say, Surah Al-Ladina An'amta Alihim, the path of those who you have bestowed your favor upon, of course, this primarily is talking about the, the Anbiya, the Prophets, but by extension, also the righteous people, the righteous Muslims, who really internalized the, the teachings of Islam and made their life uh, an example, a model for what Islam can be and what Islam can bring them. So it's quite important for us to learn the biography and it's quite empowering to learn biography of great Muslims, of uh, righteous people. Nowadays, you ask a young child, you ask uh, teenagers, who's your hero? They will say Batman or, or Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Yeah. They have all kinds of heroes that is from fiction, from movies and from entertainment. And there was a time when a Muslim, if a Muslim child is asked, if a bunch of Muslim children are asked, who is your hero? They will say, one will say Abu Bakr, the other will say Omar, the other will say Sufyan al tawri the other will say Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. They would mention these names. And these are true heroes. These are people who left a legacy in this world and made all Muslims proud to be Muslim. These are the people who really, uh, uh, how to say, with their life, they really showed the beauty of Islam and the power of Islam. So these are the true heroes that we need to know about. Uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he used to say that his favorite hobby in his spare time is to read biography of the uh, of the uh, son of Salih, of the righteous predecessors. And uh, my favorite book, of course, other than the Quran so far, is the autobiography of Malcolm X. And uh, there are many African Americans in the States who accepted Islam after reading this book. 
This book is just really profound and it teaches us so many things. Um, <clears throat> so the point is, uh, the biography of Greek people has this very relational uh, impact on you. When you feel that, okay, he's also a human being, and especially if this person is from your culture, from your, uh, you know, your root of, uh, of heritage. If, uh, for example, if you're Indian, and you read a great Indian scholar who overcame many difficulties and, become a, and became a great Muslim, you will feel relatable. You will feel, if he can do this, I can do this, right? So Islam actually talks about this relatedness. In the Quran, uh, Ibrahim made a dua. He said, رَبَّنَا وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ يَتْلَ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ Oh Allah, raise among them uh, a messenger. Send to them a messenger that is from them. مِنْهُمْ يعني, This person should be known by the people and he knows the people and he's aware of the culture and he's familiar with the social trend. He's a, a part of this society and then this person will have a large impact on this society. So each time Allah sends a messenger and a prophet, this prophet and messenger is if, uh, for that particular nation is from that particular nation. Allah never sends a Chinese prophet to Arabia, and He never sends a you know Iraqi prophet to North America. It just doesn't work that way. It has to be from this region, and that way people feel relatable, right? People feel uh, comfortable in a way that this religion this religion can be for me. I can also be as great as they can be. So all of these are about why we want to do the Muslim Legacy series. When we read about and listen about these great Muslims who lived in the past, who achieved great achievements, it will motivate us to also try harder. It will give us a high aim. It will sort of save us from uh, complacency. You know, sometimes we start to think that, well, I'm not like those people. I don't have those great qualities. I'll just be who I am, and this is what I can achieve. But when we read uh, the people who actually came from simple roots, and they also gradually improve themselves to become great and excellent and amazing. That motivates us to be great as well. And the person that I would like to talk about today, Professor Martin, rahimahullah, had that kind of impact on me. When I read his biography about two years ago for the first time, it made me have this high aim, a goal. Whether that can be achieved or not is in the hands of Allah. But at least that gave me this desire, this wish to, to be something uh, great, to achieve uh, something that's worthwhile. So after reading his book, I said, I, I want to be a scholar. That's, that's my pursuit. Instead of just, uh, I can just, my mother is a teacher, I'll just work as a teacher for my entire life and that's it. No, I want to be a scholar. I want to continue to learn knowledge uh, until I get as much knowledge as I can. And that was inspired by Professor Martin. So uh, who is him? In the poster you, you, you read that he is the, the translator, the one who translated the Quran into Chinese. But that's actually not his main description, I would say, because he would be the seventh person to translate the Qur'an in Chinese history. There were six people before him who translated Islam. And his translation of the Qur'an will, will be the tenth edition, because some previous translators translated many times different editions. So that's his main achievement, but that's, I wouldn't say that's his main character as a person. He is a scholar, and even this book, the first edition of this book, uh, his biography, is called The Pursuit of a Scholar. And he's not a scholar considered only by the Chinese people. He's a scholar considered by the Egyptian people. And that's where he studied. He studied in Egypt. He's a scholar uh, considered by many Iraqi scholars, because he also went to uh, Iraq many times uh, to, to communicate. Uh, he's a scholar who was uh, respected by many Chinese imams, although he never worked as an imam. He was never a religious leader or a community leader. But he was respected by many Chinese imams. So, uh, and he's the founder of the Ori Department of Oriental Languages in Peking University, the best university in China. And he's the first professor to teach the Arabic language in an academic institution in China. He basically raised this language to a higher status, in a way, you know, from the perspective of the Chinese people. Arabic previously was something that only Muslims use. It's almost a cultural language. It's almost a traditional language. But he raised it to the status of an academic pursuit. You can study law and medicine and nursing, and you can study Arabic as, as a major, university major. He's the person who did that. He's the first person to propose the establishment of halal restaurants in universities. Previously, Muslim students had to prepare their own food at home. They never get to eat in universities. And he established the first halal restaurant in Peking University. And he says, these people are the future of our nation. They deserve to have food at the university. So he actually had many contributions uh, to Chinese Muslims. And inshallah, today uh, we'll try to 
uh, look at some of these uh, achievements and history in his life, inshallah. Yeah. All right, so he was born on uh, the 6th of June in 1906. So that's more than 100 years ago, right? Uh, and he was born in this city called, it's actually a village called Shadian. It was a village at his time, but right now it's only a district of the city of Gejiu. And this is in the province of Yunnan. If you look at uh, the distribution of Chinese Muslims, most of them are on the peripheral, on the outs outside of China. North, uh, northwest, which is where I'm from, northeast, southwest, and there's very little on southeast. But the, basically the edge part, right, the peripheral part of China. And that is because uh, they are a small minority. We all know that Chinese Muslims are a small minority. And by the way, another reason why, well, for the Muslim legacies, uh, you know, uh, series, of course, people would think you should start with the MBA. You should start with the uh, Sahaba. How come you start with a Chinese person? Uh, and this is another misconception or uh, a thing that I want to actually challenge. You know, admit it or not, a lot of times when people mention Chinese Muslims, the first thing that comes to, to their mind is a group of oppressed people who are ignorant about Islam. And they're just, oh, poor people, let's save them. Let's save them. Let's help them. They're in need of help. I'm not saying that there are no Muslim in China who's in need, of, in need of help. Of course there are. I'm not saying that there are not uh, any ignorant Muslims in China. Of course there are. Uh, but I'm saying we shouldn't let these negative uh, reports or incidents overshadow this tremendous history of Chinese Muslims being in China for more than 13 centuries. You know, it actually, China it was uh, one of the first countries to officially accept Islam. The emperor, accept, not accept Islam, uh, recognized Islam as a religion to exist in China more than 1300 years ago, more than 13 centuries ago. Uh, and there have been, in this history of 1300 years, there have been a lot of scholars. There were people who went to Hajj during the uh, 13th century and they had to spend about four months to reach Mecca from China. And there were great scholars who uh, you know, really influenced how uh, Islam would develop in Central Asia. Some of them learned Islam from uh, the Middle East and then went on to leave a legacy in Central Asia, in some other countries like Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan. So, so in this history, there are great Muslim scholars and there are great Muslim uh, you know, legendary uh, individuals. We shouldn't overshadow this history and this, this group by the negative instance. We shouldn't think of Chinese Muslims as poor, needy, and ignorant Muslims. And, and today, and the person that I'm going to talk about uh, is, is a pride for all the Chinese Muslims because uh, of his achievements. So he was born in Shadian, and Shadian, uh, as it is, um, is a very special village in China, actually. This village currently, right now, or maybe uh, about 10 years ago when the book was written, had uh, 11,000 uh, people. The population is 11,000. And 9,000 among these 11,000 are Muslims. So this is a Muslim majority village. And this is a village that, subhanAllah, Sharia is bigger than the government. Literally, if you go there, you would say that if the government says A, and the Quran says B, people will do B. They don't care. Kill us all. That's their attitude. We'll follow the Quran, we'll follow Sharia. If you are not happy, kill us all. We don't care. <laughs> SubhanAllah, they have that kind of uh, persistence. And that, that is why this is uh, a village that is left alone by the Chinese government, in a way. Yani, they wouldn't try to enforce any laws or restrictions on religious practice in this particular village. If you visit, visit it, you will see women wearing niqab. Almost all women in, in Shadi are wearing niqab. You will see that uh, the, there are seven masjid in this small village of 11,000 people. Seven masjid. And the biggest mas masjid can contain 4,000 people in his prayer hall. And in uh, Ramadan, there will be 4,000 people in this prayer hall. It's felt. I want to show you a picture. And don't be shocked when I show you this picture. This is a masjid in a village in China. And it's not hidden, it's not secret, it's not, you know, we're trying to hide it somewhere, it still it's public. Yeah, you go it's there, you still exist. see this. Yeah, it still exists. A lot exists. Yes. And, <laughs> and this masjid uh, holds Saturday courses, uh, Saturday Islamic class for young children. It has summer courses is it, is for university students. Yunna? Sorry? It is also in Yunnan? Yes, in Yunnan and Shadi, this village called Shadi. And this is only one of the seven masjid, right? When you go there, uh, 
people are learning learning kitab al tawhid in an Arabic language wow. in this village. Wow. People are learning Greek classic Islamic literature in the Arabic language. So do we have a lot of uh, Greek students that come from this part. You know uh, Imam Suleiman Wan yeah. in Hong Kong? He is from this village. He, so his family background is from this village. But when he was young, they left this village to go to Taiwan, uh, uh, fleeing away from the war, the internal conflict in China at that time. So it was a, uh, you can see the atmosphere was very pro-Islam. The atmosphere was very Islamic. So Professor Ma Jian, rahimahullah, grew up in this environment, but in a very poor family. And, uh, wait, where did he go? I need to read the notes. <laughs> Wrote some notes. He was um, he was born in a family, and, and his father died when he was very young, maybe when he was two, three years old. And he was raised by his uncle. After that, his uncle also died when he was thirteen years old, right? Uh, so he had a turbulent childhood. And when he went to uh, uh, the primary school in that village, uh, he was one of the few uh, Muslim children, but he was. Uh, among the best of students in terms of uh, academics. And that used to anger the uh, rich Han Chinese uh, businessmen because they're like, so how, all of you are here, but you are, you're letting a Muslim to be the best? What are you doing? He was angry about that, but he was the best in terms of academics. And from a very young age, he showed his great eagerness and desire for knowledge. This is a trait, uh, subhanAllah, for many great Muslims, the desire for knowledge. Um, because to, to study and to learn is the first step towards greatness. You cannot be great without proper knowledge. Um, so he used to, after, what, you know, he used to study Chinese and mathematics and these subjects in school. But after school, he would voluntarily, by himself, go to an imam and learn the Quran and Arabic after school. Like, nobody's asking him to do this. He doesn't have a guardian to, to force him to do this. He just personally likes Islam. He's personally eager to learn the Quran and Arabic language. But he wrote, this is what he wrote, and sorry for it being Chinese, I'll translate it. He said most of the Hui people, right, in China, Hui is an ethnic uh, group uh, which is defined by the believers of, as the believers of Islam. So they are considered Hui because they believe in Islam. It's one of the ten ethnic groups in China that uh, are Muslims. How was Han and Hui? So Han is the majority ethnic group, over 95%. Yeah. And Hui is the third largest or the second largest among the ethnic, ethnic minorities ethnic. yes ethnic among the ethnic minorities. minorities and they are supposedly all muslims supposedly they are called Hui. this need this ethnic group came about because of their religion so he says the Hui people in the village uh most of them do farming or a little bit of uh side business for a living and people the Hui people who live in cities the rich ones will be doing jewelry or you know the, the ancient relic business. They will sell jewelry and you know beads and things like that. And the middle class, they own restaurants and they or they are butchers. They sell uh, beef, lamb. The poor people, they sell roti. I don't know how to translate roti and paratha and fried stuff like that. And he says, although all of these are honest jobs, but it has nothing to do with education and cultural propagation. And there are people who are working in cultural preparation, but very few. And this was his you know, uh, impression when he was a primary school student. So he already felt a, uh, you know, a need for, for Hui people, for the Chinese Muslims to educate and to propagate uh, and to do something related to culture and uh, knowledge. So when he went to, sorry again, there will be English in the next slide, uh, so when he, Showcase, when he showed his great ability to study in primary school, there was a uh, uh, entrepreneur uh, and also a, you know, a, what do you, a very charitable Muslim called Bai Liang Cheng. He owns a tea farm. Do you call it tea farm? Like a tea field. Right? Yeah, okay. And all the money that he earns by selling tea leaves, he uses it to fund Islamic uh, education. So especially to develop especially talented individuals. So when this entrepreneur saw Ma Jian and saw his performance in school, he already can tell that this guy is going to be different. He is going to be something great. So he approached Ma Jian and told him that I want you to go to Mingde Secondary School, which is the best in, in Yunnan province, the best secondary school in Yunnan province. 
I will fund your tuition and also your living expenses. You don't have to pay anything. I'll give you every money with only one condition. The condition is after your graduation from the secondary school, you will continue to study Islamic knowledge. Don't just work in the government. Don't just work in a you know uh, in a business. You have to continue to study Islamic knowledge. That's the condition. And he agreed. So he went to this best secondary school in Yunnan. He studied uh, Chinese, English, mathematics, physics, chemistry, all of these basic subjects. Um, <clears throat> and when uh, you know he he doesn't used to go back home very often because of uh, you know economic financial concerns. But when he went back once to visit the families, this entrepreneur who's funding him, Bai uh basically met with a few, these few young people that he's funding. And he asked all of them, what do you want to do in the future? What's your ambition in the future? And some said, I want to be a politician. Some say, I want to be a businessman. Some say, I want to be a teacher. And some say, I want to join the military. And all of these are actually honorable ambitions. And at that time of China, most people from the village want to be just farmers. They have no idea, they have no concept of being something great. So these are already honorable ambitions. But then when it's the Ma Jian's turn to talk about his ambition, he said, I want to be a scholar. And this was, you know, let's put it into perspective, because currently, right now, if you say, I want to be a scholar, it's normal. It just wants a lot of knowledge. But to say, I want to be a scholar at his time, when China is really was in a very uh, bad and backward situation. This was before the funding of PRC. And this was before the, uh, we call it anti-Japanese war, or you can see the Asian Pacific part of the Second World War. And this was a time when, when the Chinese people were really considered dead meat. Any foreign, any Western country can come to China and take whatever they want and they will not face any resistance. The Chinese people were so weak that they couldn't defend themselves. So to say that I want to be a scholar, people would laugh at you. What is knowledge going to do for our country? What is knowledge going to do for you? Knowledge is worthless. Earn money. Provide for your family. Survive. Right? How do you gain food? What do you mean by a scholar? By being a scholar, how do you, how do you gain food? So this is really special for him to say at that, in that context, in that social environment, and in that particular time. But he said, I want to be a scholar. And this already showed his uh, special feature. So in 1925, uh, and uh, again, to recall that he was born in 1906, so he was 19 years old now. He graduated from uh, this secondary school, about the same age that young people graduate from secondary school now. And his mother passed away in this year. Remember, his father passed away when he was very young, and his mother passed away now when he was 19 years old. It's a little similar to the Sira of the Prophet, Sallallahu So he became an orphan, and he's the oldest son. He has five brothers and one sister. When you are the oldest son at 19 years old and you have five younger brothers and one younger sister, forget about studies. Now you have to work. Now you have to make sure they are fat. Now you have to make sure that your family survives. And that's what he did. He didn't continue to study. He actually went back to his hometown and he was hired as a teacher in a primary school at the age of 19 years old. Uh, just because he was forced to financially. And there were only 85 students in this school. And most of them are Muslim students because they are from this village, this Muslim majority village. So the school actually provides Arabic and Islamic classes. You can say it's an Islamic school. And during Ramadan, the school schedule is adjusted to make things easy for people uh, because of their fasting. And Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha are school holidays. Uh, and I want to tell you that uh, since the time that I was young in my city, we also have holidays on Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha because we're Muslim students, the school gives us holiday and to the teachers also, if they're Muslim, the school give them holiday. So I want to gradually also give you the positive sides of, uh, of Islam in China. It's not all negative. Uh, the government does concern, has this concern for, well, they, they don't respect you because they think of your religion as good or better, but they respect you as a way of showing uh, you know, that, that our society is a just society and it's fair and, you know, this propaganda. So they actually gave holiday to uh, students and teachers that are Muslim. But this school is special. This is actually an Islamic school, uh, even before Ma Jin joined. But after he joined, it really, he really revolutionized this school. So this was like a little, little uh, experiment field for his talents. So he joined as a 19-year-old and he started making many changes to the school uh, system and to the structure of the school. For example, he uh, uh, communicated with, with many entrepreneurs in the village to buy books, to buy all kinds of books for the students. 
because uh, he considers reading uh, a wajib of all the Muslims. If we don't read, we can never be strong. So the library now in this school surpasses the public library of the Shadian village, and it's still there. You can go and visit the library. It's one whole building. SubhanAllah, all the books were purchased when he, uh, when he proposed and when he got this money. He also, um, he, he emphasizes, uh, you know, the combination of knowledge and, and uh, practice. So he would, all, he would usually uh, take students after school to the Muslim cemetery and, uh, and uh, put down, uh, how do you say, put uh, tree seeds to, to, how do you say, uh, to plant trees. Yeah, he used to, he used to take students to plant trees in Muslim cemetery. He used to do some uh, uh, voluntary work uh, with students as well to train them to be uh, the Muslims that we expect to see in a, in a good society. And he, after his teaching experience, although it's brief, maybe two to three years, he said, I believe that the Hui, uh, what, the, what the Hui needs the most is education. And what China needs the most is education. Only education can save our country and only education can strengthen our religion. I want to fulfill my duty as a Mu'min and also as a citizen. And there's no other way for me to do this except education. So he said for himself this... Uh, this, this role set him that he wants to uh, be an educator. 1928, when he was uh, 22 years old, uh, there was a Islamic normal, you can see it's a college, it's a, it's a tertiary education institution, tertiary institution that was founded in Shanghai. Uh, and when he was 22 years old, he was recommended and joined this school where he read the entire Quran in Arabic and also in English. And he finished reading the Muwatta of Imam Malik, uh, the collection of Hadiths. And he already started practicing Arabic composition and translation. So writing things in Arabic and also translating Arabic texts into Chinese. Uh, so this is what you can see his university experience. He spent three years there. And after three years, the first batch of students to be officially sent to Egypt as a knowledge exchange program by the Chinese government. So this is a state-funded program. Only five students are going among the, uh, you know, 400,000, sorry, 400 million Chinese people. Uh, he was one of the five, and he was the only one that is sent from this college uh, because of his diligence, because of his desire to learn. So 1931, uh, when he was uh, 25 years old, he moved, uh, he, you know, he set out moving on the November 13th, and he reached Al-Qahira, uh, on December 20th, that's more than one month. And my Egyptian brother spent actually only 12 hours or less <laughs> nowadays? 13 hours. 13 hours on the flight. But he spent one month and he passed through Hong Kong as well. Because back then, Hong Kong was like the a harbor towards the world. The Chinese people have to come to Hong Kong and then go to other parts of the world. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long and uh, hard journey. He went to Al Azhar University. He was sent to uh, Masjid Al Azhar or Jamiat Al Azhar, and he was extremely diligent. And there are many anecdotes mentioned in this book about his diligence. You know, there are about three months during the summer in Egypt where all the people of Al Qahira leave the city and go to villages. Is this true? Yes, yes it's true. The Egyptian is here to confirm. <laughs> <laughs> so they would leave the city because it's just too hot. You cannot stay there. They have to go to the you know the urban area sorry the rural area just so it's cooler and you can survive and during this about three months summer every year the city is almost empty no one's here but Majian would be staying inside his dormitory in the university because this is a great opportunity for uh, for him to catch up with the uh, with, with his classmates and other students so he would study he would uh, you know use a fan on, uh, with one hand and writing with the other hand he would do this day and night uh, study the Arabic language and Islamic science. Uh, and he was very disciplined as a student. SubhanAllah, you know, Arabs in general like to socialize, socialize and it's a, it's a good trait, you know, to create that sort of bonding and uh, brotherhood. So one day a few Egyptian friends came to his dormitory and started talking and they were having a nice conversation and they were happy. And then when it, when it was about 10 p.m., the Egyptians, they were just having a fun time, having a good time talking with him and you know, having a conversation. All of a sudden, Majen said, sorry, I have to sleep, please leave. 
and the Egyptians are like, I thought we were friends. <laughs> yani, we were having such a nice conversation. And he said, I'm sorry, excuse me, I need to sleep. Tomorrow I have to study. So they left. And to them, this is like, subhanAllah, the Chinese people are different. <laughs> You know, but this showed his discipline as a, as, a, as a student. And this is actually a quite common trait among the scholars. I've mentioned once Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah. He also wrote in his book that I am so fed up, I'm so angry at those people who come to waste my time. They are stingy with their time. They don't want to use time on meaningless stuff. But although, uh, for Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, it's different because these people this, uh, that waste his time, according to him, are very Islamically aware, and they would say, this is our haqq upon you to spend time with us. You should do this. This is your duty as a Muslim. So Ibn al said, okay, you're right. Yeah, you can spend time with me. And he started doing the trivial tasks when they are there. He pretend to be listening and conversing, but he would actually uh, sew his books. He would sharpen his pencil. He would you know, boil water, prepare his bed while his friends and family members are there. So they are stingy with their time. And this is a common trait among the scholars. Um, 1934. When he was, uh, wait, he went to Al Azhar in 1931. So 1934, about two years uh, after he studied there, he was invited by one political party of uh, Egypt. I, I, I didn't find the English name for it, uh, and they basically held an academic conference about Islamic uh, thoughts and or you know how does Islam develop in modern Egypt because this was also a special time for Egypt. I'm not entirely sure, but this was about the time when they ended the last anarchy in China and established the first uh, republic. Is that correct? Uh, I think it's <coughs> 20 years before that. 20 years before that. So it's a new republic as well. It's a new system. It's a new political structure. So they're also thinking, how do we incorporate Islam? How do we make sure Islam is uh, developing in this kind of structure? So he was invited to this academic conference. And of course, as a Chinese, he was, uh, he was invited to talk about Islam in China. And he gave a very long report in Arabic. So at this time his Arabic was already very good. He could give a report in Arabic. He started by talking about the Chinese cultures. He started by talking about Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, their features and their impact in China. And then at last he talked about uh, you know, their relationship with Islam and you're basically comparing them to Islam uh, and how Islam actually uh, avoided all the problems that are present in these other uh, philosophies and how Islam is perfect uh, in the sense that it doesn't have the weaknesses of these other philosophies and he also introduced the situation of Chinese Muslims he first of all uh, mentioned this history of over 1300 years uh, and also he mentioned uh, how the Chinese Muslims are very widespread and they're, they are very actually consistent with their religious obligations this is something special about the Chinese Muslims. You know, in an Arab country, uh, if one day you are tired or you are sick, maybe the masjid is five minutes away, but you say, I'll just stay at home and pray. Or some family members are visiting, some relatives are visiting, I'll just stay at home and pray, pray with them. I don't need to go to the masjid. But for the Chinese Muslims, until very recently, this, this has been a tradition, that it's almost considered haram to pray at home. They have to go to the masjid. They, they force their children to go to the masjid, even if it's 20 minutes away. Even if you have to take a bus, you have to go. It's almost haram for them to pray at home, although it's not. But this is one of the ways that the Chinese Muslims preserved their Islam. Because we are already a minority. And if we don't meet every, every now and then, and if we don't have this community to support each other, we will gradually dilute into the, into the society, we will gradually disappear. So they have this concern, we have to meet every day, and we have to show that we are, uh, we are a group, we are this uh, distinct uh, group. So he talked about this nature of the Chinese Muslims as well. And this is, you know, I personally can testify. I go back to my hometown uh, every year, once or twice, and then, you know, many Muslims are not very knowledgeable about Islam. They don't even know the Arabic names for Zohar and Asr, because in, in, in Northwestern China we use Persian. They say Persian, Digger. And uh, you know, for Maghrib is Sham, and for for Aisha is Khoftan. So they use Persian words. They don't even know the Arabic, and they don't even know, they don't know any Hadith or any Quran. But when I go back to my hometown, and in the morning for Fajr prayer, I've been to many masajid in my hometown. Every masjid, at least one hundred people, at least one hundred people for Fajr Jama'ah, every day. Subhanallah. So Allah has 
really distributed his mercy to different nations. Some nations have more knowledge. Some nations don't have knowledge, but they attend their Fajr Jama'ah. I've been to Turkey as well. You hear some of the best recitation of the Quran, some of the most beautiful qira'ah in, in Turkey. But in one of the central area masjid, I went to Fajr Jama'ah, less than one row of people. The first row cannot be filled. So this is really a distribution of mercy or, or virtue or blessing among different nations. And so we all face different problems. It's not like one nation is definitely better at Islam than some others. So he gave this report, and this report was so uh, uh, so good and considered so valuable that it was later published by a, by an Egyptian publisher as a book called A Brief Look at Islam in China. So his, his verbal report was published as a book, uh, and that shows how eloquent this speech was and how rich the content was. So he graduated from Al-Azhar in 1935 after four years of study. And uh, he went on to study in Darul Ulum, which was like a higher level of uh, Islamic education in Egypt and Qahira. He studied there for another four years. And in, in this time, he was already preparing the materials that he needed in order to translate the Quran. He already had this aim now. Once I go back, I will start translating the Quran into Chinese. And as I mentioned, at this time, there were already six different people before him who already translated the Qur'an. So the Chinese version of the Qur'an already existed at his time. But let's look at our time now. You go to, subhanAllah, I went to Boston, the Boston Islamic Center. Is it Boston? Yeah, it's Boston Islamic Center. Uh, they have Chinese Qur'an, right? SubhanAllah, because it's very international. And the Chinese Qur'an is by Ma Jian. So his version of translation has become the most uh, commonly used and the most widespread. And his, the, his translation of the Quran is the only one that's being published or printed by the King Fahad uh, publisher in Saudi Arabia. And that is the most uh, respected or official publisher for a Quran printing. So his Chinese translation, you know, like we also have many, many, many different versions of English translations. And among them, some are considered more authentic or uh, authoritative than others. Among them, we have Yusuf Ali, who is considered a very good translation. We have Sahih International, etc. So his translation among the Chinese translations is now have considered the official, or the, the most authoritative, the best. And the reason for that, why did he think about translating the Qur'an when there were already Chinese Qur'an existing? Because the previous nine editions and six translators, all of them, or most of them, uh, did this translation targeting Muslims. So they assume the person reading this translation already knew uh, a lot about Islam. They already knew the foundation and the fundamentals of Islam. And Ma Jian didn't have this assumption. He said, my job is not to introduce Islam to Muslims. Muslims already know Islam. My job is to introduce Islam to the Chinese non-Muslims. So this translation has to be very loyal to the original text, and this translation has to be very simple and this translation has to be very culturally sensitive to the Chinese people. This translation has to be understood by every Chinese person, no matter Muslim or non-Muslim. So he had, he had this ambition. So he was already preparing many tafsir and uh, other you know, translations of the Quran as his uh, backup for his later uh, translation. And when he uh, came back from uh, Egypt in 1939, it was a very turbulent time at China. Uh, the what we call anti-Japanese war was happening, and it was a very severe war between China and Japan. Uh, it started in 1937, so in his region, the, the the Japanese will bombard the village every now and then. You know, the bombardment aircrafts will come, and then you will hear. <laughs> Did you practice that? <laughs> really good myself. You will hear this, and people will go to. What do you call it? Like a underground uh, uh, yeah. bunkers, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go to underground bunkers, and he used to. His wife said this: when people hear the alarm and run to the bunkers, they normally take like a water bottle or a blanket, you know, survival things. Majin would take his Arabic Quran and his uh, scripts for translation. He couldn't stop translating the Quran even in the bunkers. His wife said he would start working at 5 a.m. every day, routine every day 5 a.m. and work until very late. And it, it, because he used to work in those, you know, uh, bunkers, dark areas so much that his, his eyesight was severely 
harmed. And later on, when he was 50, 60 years old, he was still translating the Quran, but he has to use a magnifier, magnifier uh, lens. You know, he used to translate with a magnifier. Uh, and 1946, about seven years later. So, subhanAllah, can you take a guess how many years it took him to translate the Quran? From the time he first started until the time that it was finalized and published, how many years do you think? Ten years. Okay, we have ten, we have twenty. Any higher? Twenty-one time, twenty-two times. It took forty years. It took forty years, and you will see why. I will tell you why. Because he was so s serious and so careful with every single word. You know, I will give you the example now, actually. Unfortunately, the non-Chinese speaking people wouldn't see how delicate these differences are. It's only a difference of unit. You know, in Chinese we have like unit words. So this book, we have something in between, this and book. This book or this book, both of them mean the same thing. But the level of format, you know, formalness is different. And when it comes to these people, he would translate, he would make a distinction between these people or such people. It could be different in the context. And when it comes to, those are the, those are the people who are uh, wondering around the falsehood, you know, there are such statements in the Quran. He would also choose the word verb very carefully. Because in Chinese, you, you, know, you know, just walking back and forth can be caused by confusion and it can be caused by anxiety. And he would choose a verb that has these connotations, these this indications that are in line with the Quran in the, the context. So every word he would search for, he would look up the Arabic word in many different dictionaries and try to find the most suitable Chinese word for it. So he took 40 years to translate the Quran. Although this was not the only thing he did. I also mentioned some of his achievements in the beginning, but now let's look at some other achievements. In 1946, when he was 40 years old, uh, he uh, Established, he was one of the person who established the Department of Oriental Languages in Peking University, and he was the founder, the sole founder of the, uh, you know, in, de in department. What is smaller than department? Sub department, maybe, of Arabic language. And he was the only professor in Peking University to teach the Arabic language. And how many students signed up for this program? Zero. No student. Because to them, Arabic is still like a Muslim thing. Why would we study Arabic? So they, the school decided to upgrade some students from a worse institution to Peking University just so that this department can have students. So 10 Muslim students were upgraded to this uh, program. The first batch of students, only 10. And almost, I think, 9 or all 10 of these students are now professors in different universities teaching Arabic in China. Uh, and he, as, as I said, he proposed the establishment of the first halal canteen in a university. At the time, it only served 50 Muslim students. And now this canteen in Peking University has capacity for 1,500 people, 1,500 people, uh, because there are more and more Muslim students going there. And his translation, he referred not only to different tafsir, uh, but also to some English translations. Uh, for example, Yusuf Ali's translation, he also referred. Uh, oh, sorry, that's the end of my presentation, but it's not the end of my uh, talk. <laughs> I'll refer to the book. Uh, so when he worked in this university, you would think that as a, as such a uh, respected scholar, teaching would be secondary to him, right? He could, he would do most of his uh, private work. That would be his priority. And this is my personal experience at Hong Kong U. Most of the professors have no interest in teaching. Their their focus or their attention is paid mostly to their research, writing writing uh, theses, writing papers, publishing papers. So teaching to them is secondary. And this is more and more common in uh, research-based institutions because research is what attracts fund, money. And uh, I'm reading a book about uh, tertiary education. They say that universities are becoming more and more like business organizations. It's, it's, uh, it's management structure and it's you know, how it runs are becoming like business organizations. But Ma Jian, according to his students, he was so serious about teaching. You know, some students are shy to ask questions in class they would write down on a piece of paper and uh, just put it down on his desk, right, to ask a question, expecting that he would explain in class. So he would come into the class and he will say that today I received a student from one of you. First of all, I will comment on the grammar of this question. 
SubhanAllah, he would comment on the grammar of the question, and he would comment on the handwriting of the, of the question. He would say, you, you should write uh, your words better. He would give so many comments, and then he would answer the question, and he would ex extend it. His classes are all, always humorous and very attractive. His students all enjoyed his class. And he did his very best to try to help students in other uh, things as well, in their daily activities. If they don't have enough money for food, he will invite them to his place for dinner. He would uh, support them in other affairs as well. So he was really uh, a mentor to these Arabic students, not only you know like an academic professor as we expect today. Uh, and also, uh, when after the People's Republic of China was founded in 1949, uh, he was also active in politics, and this really shows the hikmah of a uh, of uh, a scholar. Sometimes, you know, there are many different ways of doing the same thing. Uh, after this new state has been funded or this new government has been funded, you can just propose, uh, you can just propagate Islam in a very broad and and uh, high key manner. But that, you know, for a newly funded government, the most important thing is stability. The most required thing is your support. That's it. Mm -hmm. I just need to know that you are in, you are with us. I just need to know that you're in line with our ideas. And then I'll help you as well. But if, if the government feels that these Muslims, they are a potential threat to our authority, they will, they will just, you are a minority. They'll do whatever they want with you. They'll get, you know, they'll get rid of you. They'll deal with you. So Majin was active in politics with Hikmah, if you look at it. So he publicly uh, demonstrated his support for this government. And he earned this position among the government officials as a trustworthy person among the Muslims. And once he reached that position, when, once he had that level of respect, he started writing articles and publishing them on the government gazette. Do you call it gazette? gazette. Yeah, like the, the highest, uh, the most read newspapers that are normally talking about politics, you know, the party's vision, the future of uh, People's Republic of China. You would see articles about the first parliament meeting, the, 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 the article about uh, uh, the preliminary constitution of China. And among these huge articles about huge issues, you would find an article written by Ma Jian called Why Muslims Don't Eat Pork. <laughs> because he earned that position. He had that level of respect from the Chinese government, and he can do that. And he would also decorate this da'wah as something that is beneficial to the Chinese government. You see, we have about, at that time, 20 million Chinese Muslims. And for them to, you know, uh, help the government with whatever it wants to do, you need the other non-Muslim people to understand them. And this is what I'm doing. Why Muslims don't eat pork. He has one article called Muhammad's Sword. And this was in, in response to a common misconception in China and actually in the world that Islam spread it by violence. He wrote an article called Muhammad's Sword. He started by talking about the seerah of the Prophet and how he never, he, he never actively sought solution by violence. And he went on to talk about, he also translated a complete history of uh, Arabia, Arabic history. This book, uh, 700,000 words in Arabic. He translated the whole thing into Chinese. So he quoted many incidents in Arabic history that we didn't cater to violence. We didn't use violence as a way. He also talked about how violence Violent solutions in certain contexts or situations are necessary. And he quoted the example of the Communist Party. You guys used violence when you fought for the power, and that is praised, that is celebrated. How come we cannot use violence when it's necessary? So he had strong logic, he had strong evidences. When he wrote Why Muslims Don't Eat Pork, he has both the, the, the opinion from a scholarly theological point of view, but he also has evidence that can convince the non-Muslims. He started by saying Muslims don't eat pork because God said so. Khalas, over. Because we believe that it's what Allah commanded. And then he moved on to say, but wait a minute. Let's look at the Chinese ancient classic literature. There are more than 100 evidences that ancient Chinese people don't eat pork. He listed more than 100 evidence that people in the Zhou dynasty, in the Qing dynasty, in the Han dynasty don't eat pork. For health concerns and for many other reasons. So he, he, he made it basically impossible to argue that Muslims don't eat pork is wrong. He made it impossible to argue that. And he wrote uh, you know, many other articles about, for example, before the funding of PRC, uh, polygamy was legal in China. After the funding of P PRC, polygamy is forbidden, and you can only have uh, mo mono, 
what's the word? One wife, basically. You can have one wife. And then now the Chinese people are attacking Islam. Oh, see, you are you are challenging our constitution now because you guys allow more than one wife. How do you explain this? Wow. Professor Ma Jian wrote one whole article, uh, and he quoted you know ex uh, you know research from Western world about how even if even if legally speaking a country only allows one wife, but extramarital affair is so common that among the uh, he said among the uh, four hundred thousand American people nowadays. Their professors say that maybe among 10 to 20 people are literally only uh, had one woman in their life. Most of the Americans had more than one woman in their life. So they say that polygamy is practiced all over the world, but under different banners. Some of them just don't call it polygamy. They call them affairs, right? They call them girlfriends. You can have two girlfriends, three girlfriends, and that's okay. But if I can have two wives, with proper manners of marrying, with proper providence, and that's not okay. So he had evidence and logic uh, to, to convince the Chinese people. And Chairman Mao Zedong yeah. praised these two articles. Like he has how many wives? And why Muslims don't eat pork. He has how many wives? I don't know. He has six wives. <laughs> I don't know. But he praised these two articles. <laughs> and he actually said, Chairman Mao Zedong, who is a very stubborn person in a way, you can say. He's stubborn about his own ideology. He doesn't normally uh, agree with different mindset. But he once said to foreign uh, diplomats that, you see, China is uh, very inclusive. And the example of that is Professor Ma Jian, a Muslim, and not a Communist Party member, is translating for me and for the sake of Chinese people. He's, and Mao Zedong doesn't even know the word Muslim. He said he's a Mohammedan. I'm a communist, and we are working together. That's okay. So he really, this is hikmah, because the patience that he endured, uh, you know, the, the difficult times at first that he endured, and the patience that he demonstrated earned him this position to now do more good, to benefit more, really to help the, uh, the Chinese Muslim community to have a better position in China, in the new Chinese society. And all of these are very important contributions that Professor Ma Jian did. Um, as for, you know, during the Chinese Cultural Revolution, have you heard about the Cultural Revolution? It's a disaster, and even the Chinese government considers it a disaster. It happened during the 1970s. Uh, it's basically an ideological warfare. So the Communist Party, well not, the, a certain part of the Communist Party started waging war and really violent uh, attacks on any sort of uh, uh, idea or individuals or groups that seem to be against communism. Even those who major in foreign languages are attacked because how can you learn foreign languages in new China? So they have like very weird uh, mentalities. And of course, Professor Ma Jian, as a, as a scholar of Arabic language, was attacked uh, a lot during uh, this, this cultural revolution. But he, had, he really showcased his patience as a Muslim. And this is something special about him. Many people during this time committed suicide. Many great scholars committed suicide because they couldn't stand the humiliation and the, the, the personal attack uh, that were inflicted upon them. But Professor Ma Jian, according to the author of the book, took a very humorous attitude during this period of time. He was, uh, his title as a professor was taken away, his salary was reduced, his life was much worse, uh, but he really uh, went through this period of time with a very optimistic attitude. Um, for example, once, uh, you know, the, his boss, the one who pays him the salary, wants to make things hard for him, so, he, he used all one yuan note, like one dollar note, and that's a whole lot of money, right? So he wants to make fun of him, and he said, you are doing so, so little work, and you're getting paid so much. And Professor Ma Jian said, well, you are not paying me, the people are paying me, and if the people wishes, I can assure you some of my money. <laughs> and this, this, his boss said, who wants your stinky money? And you know, in the Chinese currency, RMB, RMB literally means people's currency, people's currency. So he said, how can you say it's stinky? It's people's currency. <laughs> so this person was just made silent and he couldn't reply anything. And there were many funny incidents like this. And you know, the author of the book would say that the reason why he was among the very few people who went through these difficulties with a very optimistic attitude was the fact that he was a Muslim. Otherwise, it's going to be hard for him because he really was uh, attacked very severely. And I just want to... Is it the political leader they, they give the pressure? It's a political movement, yes. Is it within the Communist Party? It's uh, from the Communist Party to the entire country. 
especially it's the academic field. So people who are professors, teachers, people who work in the university. Um, I want to quickly, the time is up, I want to quickly mention, and look, from this page, you know, on each page there, there are eight atoms here, can you see? All of these are the works that he either translated or composed. Wow. And this book only mentioned a part of it, and that's already, let me see. He has written an article called, Can We Eat Rabbit Meat? <laughs> um, he, he translated Arabic Chinese uh, dictionary. And this translation, uh, sorry, he, he composed Chinese Arabic uh, dictionary, and this version of his is still being used today in all the institutions. He wrote uh, Muhammad's Swords, that's already mentioned in 1951. He, he, he had this uh, uh, article in Arabic and Chinese about a brief look at Islam in China, which was from uh, his, uh, his verbal report. He translated the entire Quran in Chinese. And I want to give you a few examples of how me being a Chinese Muslim who has read many Arabic uh, English translations and who is also able to, alhamdulillah, understand the Quran in the Arabic language to some extent, I can testify that uh, his translation at many places are better than English translations. Let me give you an example. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ مَعَ in Arabic means with. In many English translations, you would find it would say that for indeed after difficulty comes ease. That's not, it's not ba'da, it, it doesn't mean after. But uh, Professor Majin's Chinese translation said, Indeed, difficulty is accompanied by ease. And that is closer to ma'al, you know, the, the Arabic translation. And there are many uh, examples of this, how his translation in Chinese is actually more accurate and more precise than the English translation. Uh, and sometimes, subhanAllah, I mean, you know, you may think that Oh, so many years have passed, and now so many more Chinese Muslims have learned Arabic, and have learned other languages, and have more exposure to different translations of the Quran. We can produce a better translation now. But I personally can testify that until now, I don't think there's anyone that can surpass his translation. Because sometimes I would, I, you know, for example, I would think I have read so many English translations, I can understand Arabic. But when I uh, sometimes give talks in Chinese, and when I quote the Quran, automatically, even unconsciously, my translation is the one that I read from Professor Mazian's translation. It's not even my own words, because I cannot say it in a better way than, than he said it. It's very simple, it's very concise, and it's very uh, loyal to the original text. And this is one feature of, the Arabic, uh, of his translation. Many other Chinese translations are actually not purely translation. They are translation with some tafsir mixed in it. So the authors would actually write their own understandings within the translation. And that causes problems. What if your understanding is only is not complete? What if your understanding represents one school of thought, right? But Professor Majian's translation is purely translation. He has a separate tafsir of the first ten ajzat of the Quran, and I, I have been looking for it, and it's hard to find. But he doesn't add this part to his translation. Yeah, I mean his his tafsir is a separate additional material, but his translation is very loyal to the original text. Not a single word more than what the Qur'an says. He wants to prevent his own understanding from reaching people's mind. You, all you need to know is what Allah said. What I have to say about the Qur'an, if you want to read, you can read, but separately. That's different. So he, he is the first person to do this, I would say, because I've read other Chinese translations of the Qur'an as well. Very commonly, they would put their own understanding and tafsir and interpretation in it. He translated the Egyptian constitution into Chinese. And that helped the Chinese people draft the Chinese constitution. And believe it, believe it or not, uh, in, the in the 20th century, about 1960s uh, all the way to 1990s, the Chinese government is very close and friendly to all the Arab countries. To all the Arab countries. Because they feel that we share the same history. We are all fighting imperialism and establishing our own uh, government. Uh, so we actually, in 1980s, people, Chinese people have found uh, paintings uh, that says, support Palestinians, 1980s China, in China, on the walls of police stations, on the wall of fire stations, you would see pictures that says support Palestinians, yeah. subhanAllah. Uh, and he translated the history of the Arabic Peninsula. He translated many, subhanAllah, the first book that he ever translated when he was still a student in Al-Azhar was uh, Risala Tawheed by Muhammad Abdu. Although Muhammad Abdu is a controversial figure, and his thought and his ideas 
uh, are up to debate whether you agree with them or not is a separate issue. But this book, Risalat Tawheed, uh, why did Ma Jian Rahimahullah decide to translate this book as his first translation? Because he says the Chinese people's understanding of Islam is too abstract or too far away from the foundation of Islam. And he says the foundation of Islam is La ilaha illallah. And if you don't understand this, you, sh you shouldn't try to understand other things. So he says in China we still haven't had any literature that talks about the shurutu tawhid, the conditions of oneness of Allah. So it's translated as theology of unity. So he translated this book uh, and published it in China, which really started a, you know, a, a, a large impact in China. People now start to go to the basics of Islam again. Uh, originally people would argue about is rabbit meat halal? Can we eat horse? These things. But now people are talking about the nature of Allah. Although arguments, debates, but it's good. These debates are valuable. These debates are worthwhile. You, you should know about the nature of Allah. You should know about the asma wa sifat of Allah. So he started this you know, reorientation Re uh, you know, reprioritization of uh, of Islam. I think my time is up. Um, I can see you want to keep going, bro. Yeah, inshallah. So, a summary. Let's let's try to summarize his life. I'll go to the first uh, slide. You know, not a single person is perfect, uh, and his his religious philosophy, his own understanding of Islam, and his own practice of Islam, is actually also criticized by many Chinese uh, uh, Muslims. For example, his wife doesn't wear hijab, and you can see that he doesn't have a beard. And some Chinese Muslims will be like, what kind of scholar are you if you don't have a beard? Right? Even as small as this is okay. Now I go to Shenzhen Masjid, I'm acceptable. Even if I wear a suit, it's acceptable. I have a, some, some, a little bit of beard. Yeah. But if I don't have a beard, get out of here. Right? So he doesn't have a beard, his wife doesn't wear hijab. And his thought, his uh, Islamic philosophy is mostly influenced by Islamic modernism which was mostly funded by Muhammad Abdul in the um, uh, you know, early 20th century, which talks about the evolution of Islam, how Islam should develop and sort of fit in modern society. And that, of course, is an arguable and debatable opinion mm. on, the, uh, on Islam. What, we are trying to, uh, what I'm trying to say is that when we, when we learn from a person, take the good and leave, leave what you don't agree. Don't uh, deny a person's value just by one part that you don't agree with. Today, during the khutbah in Hong Kong U, uh, the khatib gave the example of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. SubhanAllah, he was one of the greatest sahaba. He was a person that the Prophet ﷺ uh, praised. And was he among the ten that were guaranteed Jannah? No? Uh, okay, anyway, but he was a high-status sahabi, right? But he made a mistake of one day calling uh, Bilal, Ya Bana Sauda. Oh, son of a black woman. He made this mistake. And we cannot say, okay, Abdar is racist. Well, let's not look at his story. Let's not read his sirah. We cannot do that. He has so many other virtues that we can learn. And he corrected his uh, mistake when he made it. So when we look at a person, we learn from a legacy, uh, le legendary person. It doesn't mean he's perfect. It doesn't mean everything about him is worthwhile, uh, is worth learning. You take what is good and you leave what you don't agree. It's okay. And every person has some shining traits that you can learn. Right? So what we learn from Professor Matien, if I am to summarize, mainly, first of all, is his diligence in pursuing knowledge. His ability to stay in Al-Qahira during the summer, all by himself, in Al-Azhar, studying by himself. His, his diligence to visit uh, an Imam nearby Al-Azhar every day after school, extra, just to correct his tajweed in reading the Quran. His, his self-discipline of telling your friends, it's about 10, please leave, I need to sleep. SubhanAllah, I think these are the things that uh, can really help your journey in learning knowledge. These are the things that will enable you to learn knowledge better and more efficiently. And also, his, his carefulness, his, how to say, um, detail-orientedness with the Qur'an, his attitude towards the Qur'an. Even every word, I have to be careful. I cannot convey a wrong idea. I cannot convey... A lot of times, uh, you know, uh, when we quote the Qur'an, and we only convey the general meaning of the ayah, and we don't know the exact meaning of the ayah, and we are not concerned at all about it. And this is wrong. What if you're, what you are saying is not entirely what the Quran is saying? And he had that attitude, that careful uh, respect towards the Quran, and his patience and uh, endurance during hard times, and his hikmah of, of doing da'wah. Right? This is really something that I learned personally. I can just be 
a mujahid, and I can stand up and say, oh, you evil government, you're oppressing our people, and this and that, and then my voice will be taken away, and whatever benefit I can do will be impossible for me anymore. In a specific situation, you have to think about how to benefit in this situation. If you cannot change that situation, think about how you make use of that situation, right? So, uh, this, should be re this should be off record, you can cut it afterward. But security people from China have met me several times about my da'wah. But they, they cannot pick anything from my da'wah because I never, I never say anything against the Chinese government. I never say anything against the Ch Chinese government in public, so they have nothing to pick. And even if I go to Shenzhen Masjid now once in a month to talk about Islam, they cannot stop me. You're, you're not, not doing anything wrong. But as for those activists in China who are, you know, criticizing the government and doing this and that, their voice is taken away. They have no platform anymore. And what da'wah is left for these people? So we have to have that hikmah. In, and it's hard for you to understand this, but I hope the Chinese Muslims can understand this. Because for a hard situation, you have to have, uh, you know, uh, hikmah. You have to have specially designed methods, methodology. So these are the lessons we can learn from the life of Professor Ma Jian. Uh, I pray that Allah forgive his mistakes and uh, accept all of his service towards Islam and uh, unite him with all the righteous people uh, and uh, all of us in Jannah, inshallah. Ameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanakallah ma'u bihamdi. Kashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiru ka wa atubu ilik. Sallallahu wa sallam. Mubarik wa la nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother, I think maybe we skip the Chinese, Chinese? summary today. Okay. It's no too late. Maybe no we can do it some other time. So no problem. Please. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions about? So was he just doing the translation or also the tafsir? He wrote a tafsir uh, of the first 10 ajza of the Quran. He wanted to write tafsir for the entire Quran. But first of all, because he was too careful, like it, I think each Jews took him about a few years. So he wrote 10 Jews, that's 40 years. That's one thing. And the second thing was, when he, was very, uh, when he got old, his eyesight was severely uh, deteriorated. So he couldn't even read from a page of... He had a secretary to help him read and write. So it has become really hard for him to write tafsir. So he focused his uh, last bit of... He literally worked on a translation of the Quran until the day he died. It was reported in by the author that on the day that he passed away, he was still with his secretary checking the translation of the Quran, making sure every word is correct. My Allah is the one.